Up next on ITV, how can I help with your host, Ronnie Doss? Hi, my name is Ronnie Doss, and I recently graduated from UCSD. My parents were proud, I felt accomplished, but now like so many others in my situation, I'm trying to understand what to do next. I'm interested in the environment and green policy, but it's hard to determine what's actually useful and what's just a marketing scheme. So I went out to learn from the ground up what local San Diego businesses, industries, farms, and nonprofit groups are doing to make a difference by educating, implementing, or currently using green and sustainable practices. So sit back, relax, and welcome to How Can I Help? The San Diego scenery makes us a city built in a picture-perfect place. Based on our postcard paradise, I want to see who's setting the scene by planting plants using green and sustainable techniques. Hope you have the stamina to keep up with this growing adventure as we go native with planting plants. I'm here with the executive director of the Water Conservation Garden, Marty Eberhardt. So Marty, thank you for having us today. Oh, it's great to be here. Oh, great, great. So tell us a little bit about the history of the Water Conservation Garden. Okay, well the garden was the brainchild of a couple water districts and the Grossmont uh, Kuyamaka Community College District. After the drought in the 80s, uh -huh. they decided that maybe people needed some demonstrations of how to have low water use landscapes and that maybe that would be the great way to save water in this, in this region. It took a while to get started, didn't open until 1999, and then lo and behold, we just had another drought. And even though that just was declared over, I think we all know that you know saving water in the landscape is an absolutely a long-term necessity now. Mm -hmm. I always say conservation doesn't have to be deprivation. Okay. I think this garden is a really good example that water-conserving landscapes can be absolutely beautiful, <laughs> and absolutely. it's the way to go. Great, great. So uh, what are some of the sustainable uh, plants and trees that we have in this area? Well, there are, there are many. Yeah. Um, you, you know, we have native plants. We have a whole section of our garden that is California natives, but we also have plants from Mediterranean climates worldwide that okay. uh, climates that are just like ours, which have a long, hot, dry summer and then a rainy winter like the one we've just been having. Okay. Um, so we have a, you know, pretty diverse plant palette that we're showing here. Um, this is a, a plant from the European Mediterranean right here, rock yeah. rose. And we have plants from the Mediterranean climates in uh, South Africa and Australia and New Zealand and other parts of the world. So what are the best reasons to go with these kind of plants? Well, you're saving water. I mean, this is really um, a, an issue for us. Um, you know, we, the, there are even as as the governor just declared the drought over, even so, there are you know water issues from the Colorado River. There are lawsuits about endangered species coming down from the Delta. There are issues about snowpack melting early, and um, there are sort of nonstop issues that mean that saving water needs to be a way of life. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But everybody's water bills are going up. And uh, that's not going to stop, folks. So, <laughs> so this is also a way to save money, which is something that everybody wants to do. And then finally, I think it's a way to, you know, really have a sense of place about San Diego, to have landscapes that look like, that are in sync with San Diego's climate, that are in sync with the Mediterranean climate. Great. And what kind of uh, programs or activities do you offer? Uh, oh, residents? Well, we uh, have tons. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. We actually have a huge event coming up April 9th. That okay. is our Spring Garden Festival that we have every year. But we have one in the fall, too. And at these festivals, there are plants for sale. There's all kinds of landscape advice. There are all kinds of really fun kids' activities. Um, and, you know, irrigation product demonstrations. Everything that you might need to learn about low water use landscaping and have a good time at the same time. Oh, wow. In addition, we've got lots and lots of classes, everything from water smart edibles to wow. uh, ask the designer. Oh, wow. Okay. So you can come <laughs> in with your plans, your hand-drawn plans of your front yard and talk to a professional about oh, what, you, what you might do. Uh, to, you know, again, irrigation classes. 
And then we have wonderful kids programs, which I think you've got some footage of. So <laughs> yeah. because we believe that if if we get the kids to learn about conservation, um, that's really what's going to make a difference to San Diego's future. Wow, that's great. So you just get a very big variety of people that you can just help from the beginning to the end with this process. That's what we're looking at. We have uh, programs from uh, early childhood kids. We've got three and four year olds coming here wow. all the way up to <laughs> as far as you can go. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, thank you very much for all that information. Uh, do you mind showing us around a little bit? I'd love to. Oh, great. Thanks. Okay. Okay, well this is um, a wax flower from Australia and it's a wonderful plant because you know they grow really fast, they have lots of color, and so you have a plant in your yard that takes up a lot of space, has a lot of color, doesn't use very much water. What well, more can you ask for? Water wise indeed. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, since we're now in the Australia New Zealand loop, this is a grevillea, which is from that part of the world, and um, these wow. have been increasingly popular plants with with our visitors, they're really <laughs> super cool and they bloom for months and months. Well, thank you so much for having us here today, Marty. Well, I'll definitely check out the website and uh, keep in touch. Thank you so okay. much. Have a great so day. So glad you guys came. We're here in beautiful Chula Vista, California, and yesterday I got to check out the conservation garden and really kind of find out a little bit more about native and sustainable landscapes. So we wanted to come out today and get a good feel of somebody who's actually putting landscapes into their residential garden. So could you tell us what motivated you, why you decided to? Absolutely. Um, I'm from Virginia. Oh, okay. And in Virginia, there's lots of rain. <laughs> and after 30 years in Southern California, I finally decided there was not lots of rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My water bill was going up. Oh, okay. And I have been interested in a low water use landscape almost since I moved here. Oh, okay. And then I met Susan. Oh, great. And Susan <laughs> said, I do this. <laughs> I said, oh, wonderful. Come over and let's talk. Perfect. And that's how it started. Great. So, I mean, you've been working on this project for a while. So what mm -hmm. uh, did you do? What were the steps? How do you uh, start with uh, landscape design? When I design a landscape and I consult with a client, Jean, the first thing I do is I like to understand how she's going to use the garden. Okay. Is it something that's, um, you know, for entertaining? Is it something that she wants to uh, have some sentimental plants in? Is it something that's just about water usage? or are there bigger issues? And Jean had this um, aesthetic, this beautiful aesthetic of softness and greenness and lushness okay. that I wanted to personify in this garden. So beyond just low water use, it had to be beautiful. Okay, Absolutely. that was your big thing, was yes. it has Absolutely. to be beautiful. It has to be beautiful. Awesome, amazing. So yeah, what can we do today? How can I help, Susan? Well, in the backyard, we planted Fragaria, which is a California native strawberry. And one of the things that is really important for me is that I come back and we visit a garden to make sure okay. that the kinds of things that took are really taking and we encourage that. So we're going to plant more for glory. Sounds amazing. Let's get going. Okay. So we're in the backyard. Could you just show us uh, a little bit of what we have to do? One of the things that's worked in this garden has been the California strawberry. Um, you can see some of them around here. This one is doing quite well and it started to throw off babies. Oh. We're going to encourage the covering of this area as a ground cover by putting in more of these and these runners actually will produce new plants. So oh. we're going to put in a plant and it's going to have baby plants. With California natives, uh -huh. you don't dig a big hole. You dig just enough to put the plant in. They don't like to have their roots disturbed. Okay. And they do want to get right into the native soil. So you're not amending the soil, you're not putting any additives in the soil, nothing. Okay. They want to live in this soil. So we're going to put this baby right in here. Okay. Let's dig this hole. Oh, right. dig. There yeah. we go. Got it. That looks pretty good. Looks about good? Yep. Okay. Now we're going to gently take the plant out of the container. Uh -huh. Hold it in my hand very gently. Oh, uh, okay. Turn it upside down. Put it in the hole. There we go. Beautiful. Nice. See how it just fits? Oh, yeah, okay. Now back and fill it. Back it. And the other really important thing with natives, uh -huh. when you plant them, is press the soil in nicely, 
And then we're going to water this. Oh, okay. We're going to put somewhere between 10 and 20 gallons of water on this. Oh, wow, okay. Which is really a different kind of um, planting method. And what it does is it establishes the, the plant very, very well. Without that, uh, the plant really doesn't have much of a chance of survival. Okay. Unlike um, exotics where you've planted them into an amended soil mm -hmm. that's more like what they came from, because this is going into the native soil, it needs to kickstart its whole ecology. Oh, okay. So that's it. That's so we just add this plant. water, and then um, after it's done with the establishing, then uh, will it basically be on the native uh, time clock of water mm -hmm. cycles and it stuff will. like that? It will. It needs very little water. It drains rapidly. These plants are very much adapted to taking what they need out of the, out of the uh, water that comes by very quickly. Okay. They're very efficient. And you'll start to notice that they're happy when they start throwing off their runners. Okay. And in fact, we have some fruit on this one right over here. Yeah, See I was that? noticing this right here. So yes. these are the little strawberries. Those are the strawberries. Them. They're edible. They're oh, sweet. Oh, really? Uh, they are a delicacy. Um, really? Yes. And you, you can mind if I take one, Jean? No, go ahead. Wow. That's really delicious. That's <laughs> they like, really this are. Good, uh, this yes. a sweet, like, packed flavor. Yes. Yeah. So my philosophy about California native plants in the garden is that it's part of our heritage, it's sustainable, mm -hmm. and my tagline is native gardens for green living. <laughs> it allows us to live in harmony with nature the way that we were supposed to, that, uh, that allows us to use less water because water is such a scarce resource here in California. 80% of our water is imported. So if we can use our water really wisely, mm -hmm then it provides for our future. We want it to be beautiful so that people can look out on lush landscapes that uh, reflect their own aesthetic. And I like to have the gardens be able to uh, reflect the owner's personality and their needs. If they're entertaining, if they have children, animals, all those sorts of things. Even if they want to grow something like tomatoes, zucchini, whatever, all of that fits together with native gardens. Absolutely, well that sounds amazing. I'm so happy that your community is helping and dancing. Thank you so much for your time. Let's get established with water conservation as we go out on a limb and branch out to hunter irrigation. Landscaping accounts for about half the water Californians use at home. As an innovator in irrigation, Hunter is making traditional and sustainable landscapes more water efficient. So we headed on down to San Marcos to see how irrigation and water conservation get connected. So how does Hunter Irrigation fit into the sustainable landscape picture? On the local level is how we manufacture. We were founded in 1981 by Ed Hunter, who was definitely an innovator. We uh, really try and focus on our minim minimizing our impact mm -hmm. of our industry on a local level uh, through uh, careful management of resources, okay. reuse and recycling. Uh, this building is a great example. It's LEED Gold certified. So oh, wow. another, <laughs> another thing is on the roof is actually a solar plant that provides 100% of the electrical needs in the building. On a global level is the products that we manufacture. They're manufactured with high efficiency in mind, not only for water consumption and, and savings, but also for labor. Okay. So uh, why is water conservation important? What are the economic advantages of our They're huge. As, as the world population grows, the demand for water increases. And water is used um, quite extensively in the landscapes outside of the different buildings and residential applications. For us, we have to continue to provide high efficiency solutions and minimize our water usage so that we can share with the rest. Interesting. Well, uh, can you take a look at your facility? Yeah, let me, sure. let me show you around. So is there a reasonable timetable to recover your costs when you're making a sustainable landscape? Very reasonable nowadays. It also depends on the existing system, the condition of it, as well as the prior practices. But it could be as little as one to two years, depending on how elaborate of a retrofit and uh, improvement is done to the system. Oh, great. Is retrofitting an existing business or residential system easy to do? It's extremely easy. Let me give you a little quick demonstration. This is a typical uh, pop-up lawn sprinkler, and it's, it's currently installed with a traditional spray nozzle. Out in the field, basically all the thing that has to happen is the traditional nozzle is removed, uh -huh. take that off, remove the old screen, and drop in one of our MP rotators, which is a high-efficiency spray nozzle, and 
spread it back on the sprinkler. Oh, wow, it's easy as that. Yeah, after <laughs> that, you set it up and adjust it, and it's done. Now the sprinkler is, will be 30% more efficient than the traditional spray one that was in here. Wow, that took you, what, five, ten seconds to do? Yeah. <laughs> you might have a lot more sprinklers on this site, so yeah. it may take a little bit longer than just this one simple. But yeah. that's it basically is a, is effective and a, an easy way to upgrade a system. All right, Ronnie, I'm going to take off. We're uh, ramping up our sales, and uh, the season's upon us. So I'm going to leave you with Darius Catalano to explore some more of the innovations here that are happening in Hunter Industries. Thank you so much, Troy. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you, Darius. Thanks for your time. Hey, no problem. So uh, what are your day-to-day -day activities in designing, producing, and manufacturing Hunter irrigation products? Well, the engineering department here at Hunter is very involved in performing quality checks and performance testing on all our products to make sure that the customer's expectations are met. Uh, Hunter Engineering is also very actively involved in new product development projects. So an engineer day to day might meet in the test with the test group, might meet with the product development project. And um, case in point, you know, Hunter has been uh, pretty consistent in releasing new products just about every year. Yeah. Darius gives a look at the inner workings of Hunter Irrigation as we checked out the manufacturing done right here in San Diego. What is the MP Rotator? The MP, MP Rotator is a revolutionary spray nozzle and water conservation tool from Hunter Industries. Uh, the main difference with the MP Rotator over traditional spray nozzles is that the MP Rotator puts down water at a much slower rate, and we call this the application rate. Because water is applied more slowly, the soil has a better chance of soaking up all the water. Most standard spray nozzles have an application rate that's greater than the soil absorption rate. Well, thank you for your time. I really learned a lot about efficient water use, irrigation innovation products, and got a really good clear picture of sustainable landscapes. Great, glad we could help. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Hunter Irrigation really showed me how landscape irrigation can be done economically, efficiently, and with environmental considerations. But now I'm checking back with Susan Krizwicki, who is a member of the California Native Plant Society at the Old Town State Park Native Plant Garden. So let's get planted as we check out how native flower power is the manure cure. Hi Susan, so could you tell us where we are right now? We are in Old Town, San Diego. This is the birthplace of our city. And this is the California Native Plant Garden. This was um, sponsored by the California Native Plant Society to bring this patch of earth back to the way it was before the Europeans arrived here in San Diego. Great. Why do you feel this is an important cause? This is so important because here we are in San Diego. If people come here, they should see what we're really about, what our heritage is, what our, um, what our climate is really like. We have this gorgeous climate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Here in March, where it's uh, probably 70 degrees and sunny, yeah. we have a wet, rainy winter and a dry, warm summer. So those planting conditions require certain types of plants that can adapt. If we don't do that, what we do is we overwater, we over-fertilize, we over-chemicalize. And if we can just move back more to native plants, then we can get more in sync with the environment. Okay, so what are the differences between uh, native and sustainable landscapes? The native plants are the ones that have been characterized as being here before the arrival of the Europeans. Sustainable plants are generally considered to be low water usage, low chemical usage, low pesticide usage, but they're not necessarily the same. The California natives have an even more specific heritage to this California floristic province. So can landscaping be done in an affordable and sustainable way? Absolutely. Native plants make a really good alternative because you don't amend the soil, you don't bring in a whole bunch of uh, soil that you have to buy, there's no transportation costs involved in that. The uh, native plants themselves are generally sourced from somewhere in the local uh, environment since they have to be grown within their, their uh, tolerance range. Okay. And um, because the plants like to be spread out a little bit more, you sometimes don't even wind up putting in as many plants as you would for bedding out plants that you would in a conventional environment. Uh, because you don't need the, all of the chemicals that are involved, you save money there. You don't need a lot of the pesticides that are involved, but you can save money they, there. And your water bill. Some of these plants don't get watered during the winter at all. Oh, okay. Now, exotics require uh, very regular water. Uh, grass sometimes three times a week. All of the grasses that we have are um, 
not naturally mown into a big flat surface. They mix into an environment oh. like plants. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to have it actually be a habitat as opposed yes. to a uniform. As opposed to a carpet. <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, what are some of the benefits to the community? I think the biggest one is the sense of place. That sense that you're doing something that's really truly about San Diego. We live in a beautiful place, and I want it to reflect our heritage. Have you noticed any misconceptions people have about native plants? There are several, yes. One of them is that there are periods when there's nothing blooming in the garden. You'll find that native plants bloom different things, bloom at different times all throughout the year. Early spring, late summer, into the fall, and we even have winter blooming plants. Awesome. Well, I think you've really helped me clarify a lot of the questions I had about native and sustainable landscapes and how it's really improving and enhancing San Diego. So thank you so much for your time, Susan. Thank you, Ronnie. I really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you for inviting me to your home. I'm real excited to learn more about the green and sustainable practices people are using in sustainable landscapes. And uh, I just really want to get to know how people are actually applying it into their own homes. So what got you guys interested in uh, sustainable landscapes? Ice plant on the slope back there, a few straggly rose bushes and Nile lilies over against the fence. And it was very, very boring. Yeah. And I met Phil who was working for Parks Department, County Parks at the time, and uh, he said, you could have much nicer things in your backyard than what you have, oh. and the rest is history. <laughs> great, great. And then, uh, so was uh, landscaping a gradual progression or something you guys just, as soon as you came in, you're like, I want to do Very gradual. Gradual. It was, it was a progression mm -hmm. of putting in different things, seeing what worked, what didn't work, what died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and things do. Yeah, things do, yeah. Yes. We started with a Monterey pine, which we bought as a living Christmas tree in a pot. Mm -hmm. And that was absolutely the wrong choice because it's <laughs> not native to this particular area. Uh -huh. And as we discovered, uh, things like that are not going to be happy. Okay, so there but was a little bit of a learning curve. There was a on pretty it. big learning curve. A pretty curve. big learning curve. We <laughs> would plant things like sages in this part of the yard, which is the lowest part of the yard, uh -huh. and the rains collect here, and the sages promptly rotted and died. Oh, <laughs> so okay. It okay. took us a while, but eventually we learned not to fight nature, uh -huh. to select appropriate plants for the location, and to select plants that are appropriate for our immediate area. And that, uh, that helped. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. For people watching, how could they begin creating something like this? There are a lot of resources out there that you can look at to find out what information you need to before you start buying things and, and making the mistakes that we did of putting it in the ground <laughs> and have it exactly. dying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which exactly. you don't want to do because it's your time and it's expensive and mm -hmm. it's also frustrating that, well, these things keep dying on me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to plant natives. Uh -huh. I think that's one of the common things that happens to people is okay. they, they go out and they buy all these natives and they put them in the ground and they die them. Well, I'm not going to do this. Yeah, it's yeah. too hard. It's going to, it, I'm frustrated and they're going to die. Oh, okay, okay. Since you began this garden, have you noticed any misconceptions people may have about native plants or something people have a brought lot. up? A lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think probably one of the oldest is that once you mention natives, people think, oh, cactus, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> well, oh, right, yes, there are some cactus that mm -hmm. are coastal and some, a few in this area that you could plant, but most of the cactus they belong out in the desert. So yeah. sure, if you live out in the desert and you want to plant natives, mm -hmm. plant cactus, but that's probably one of the oldest. Okay. Yeah, one of the other misconceptions is that if you plant a native plant uh, landscape, it's going to look like uh, Coles Mountain in it's the gonna summer. It's going to be brown. Uh, it's going to be brown around. and mm -hmm. dead and ugly. And, and in fact, you can select things. Uh, for instance, the toyon <coughs> here, uh, in our front yard, we have a plant called lemonade berry. Huh. These stay nice and green and beautiful year round without any water at all. Oh. Uh, once you get them established, you do have to water maybe the first year, Okay. but uh, not all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the other misconception people have. They, they kind of uh, 
kill their plants with kindness <laughs> sometimes by watering water them too much, much. Oh, really? fertilizing them. Natives don't actually like a lot of coddling <laughs> in that way. So yeah, your yard does not have to be brown in the summer. Oh, yeah. so why do you find um, reducing your footprint is important? Why do you think uh, other people should take into this and consider it? Just, I think, from the aspect of contributing less to, to climate change, mm -hmm. so that you, it, it's more than just a feel-good thing, it's actually doing something. Yeah. Um, and sure, you can you can feel good about it, why not? Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> Well, it has to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. and it, yeah, climate change is a huge problem, and, and you know, we're a drop in the bucket, but maybe we can influence somebody else to think a little more about it. And it would be nice to have a livable planet for yeah. everyone. It would be nice for people's grandchildren to have a livable planet. <laughs> once, you get, once you get going, um, I don't really fuss with the yard very much. I might have to do a little pruning now and then if things get over enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. No but fertilizers. No oh, fertilizer. Nice. Don't have to worry about the irrigation system. Don't have to think about any of that. You just kind of enjoy what comes up. Nice. And so I take it you guys enjoy your landscape? You guys have enjoyed this uh, decision? Very much. Very yeah. much, yeah. Very much. It's and it's great. That's amazing. Well, thank you guys so much for inviting us to our home. And oh, you're welcome. This is a beautiful place. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank sure. you so much for coming. Yeah. Through landscaping, I learned water conservation necessities are a recipe for action. So it's great to see some solid solutions with native and sustainable landscaping. Hope you enjoyed the show. See you next time on How Can I Help? To find out more about all our wonderful guests or to get some information about this issue, be sure to log on to www.howcanihelpsandiego.com. See you there, Eco Diego fans. On the next episode of How Can I Help? Production is a process, and we're taking a time out to catch up. On the next episode of How Can I Help? We get a local buzz when we check out San Diego's homebrew and craft beer community. Think while you drink, and beer no evil. Friday, July 29th at 6 p.m., only on ITV Channel 16. What you, what you want, what you, what you want. Come on.